Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to look at excise taxes and their impact on the efficiency of the market. And it's all in Chapter 7 of your textbook, uh, pages 168 to 183. And what we're going to look at is uh, how excise taxes impact equilibrium output and price. We'll look at um, how you can measure the total amount of money that will be collected as a result of the tax. And we'll talk about how um, excise taxes impact the total surplus of the market and how we can um, estimate the relative impact on the market and the relative impact on producers versus consumers of an excise tax depending on the elasticity uh, of demand and supply. To start off with, we need to look at what is an excise tax. And an excise tax is a tax that is levied on an individual unit of a good or a service sold. And we have lots of examples of excise taxes, things like the gas tax, where you pay a certain amount of tax for every gallon, or the cigarette tax, where you pay a tax per pack, um, are all examples of excise taxes. And they do create a loss of efficiency within the market. We don't end up at our original equilibrium point. We end up at a, a new uh, point that is less than efficient. So we can visualize an excise tax by drawing out a regular supply and demand model um, where equilibrium price and quantity are designated by um, the intersection of supply and demand. So in this case, it'd be two dollars per gallon uh, of gasoline and we would be selling one million gallons of gas. We could then imagine a situation in which the government instituted a one dollar per gallon tax um, and they could decide that they're going to institute that on suppliers and say that as a supplier if you're selling gasoline then figure out how many gallons of gas you've sold and multiply it by a dollar and that's how much you're going to owe us. And if they were to do that then we would see uh, the supply curve shift up or, or I should say to the left, it would shift uh, by one dollar. So it would shift to the left and create what's called a tax wedge um, that's, that uh, is one dollar um, in size. So for every um, unit uh, sold, instead of selling it at $1.60, they'd be selling it at $2.60. Instead of selling a million gallons of gasoline at $2, you would need, they would need to receive $3.00 um, to be willing to supply a million gallons of gasoline because uh, one dollar is in tax and um, the the other remaining two dollars is what they were willing to accept prior to the tax. So this tax wedge is important um, and it will be the size of the tax. The quantity um, supplied will then shift to the left. A new equilibrium will exist. In this case this new equilibrium point is uh, right here at 0.8 million gallons of gasoline and at two dollars and sixty cents per gallon. So we see an increase in price and a decrease uh, in quantity. There is a certain amount of efficiency that we've lost and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second but um, the efficiency is lost when you think about the fact that without government intervention our equilibrium is at a million gallons of gasoline. Now we're at 800,000 gallons of gasoline. Um, if the government had not existed, there's an entire segment here um, that we would have uh, had trades for, which we will not have. So we're selling less at a higher price. That creates some inefficiencies in the market. Now, who pays the tax is, is interesting. Um, the price paid by the consumers or the suppliers is called the tax incidence. The, um, the burden of the tax. And it turns out that um, the burden of the tax is paid for by both consumers and suppliers. Uh, the total size of the tax is that tax wedge. Um, and how big the tax incidence will be for consumers versus producers is dependent upon the elasticity of demand and supply. For example, if we're looking at um, a market that looks like this and supply is relatively elastic and demand is uh, relatively inelastic, we see that if there's a, a one dollar per gallon gasoline tax, the tax wedge, which is the gap between supply and demand, would be exactly one dollar. And uh, if we compare it to the original equilibrium, we see that the amount of tax paid for by uh, suppliers is this little tiny portion right here because suppliers were going to receive two dollars per gallon prior to the tax. Now they're only receiving a dollar ninety five uh, as a result of the tax. Consumers were paying uh, two dollars per gallon of gas. Now they're paying two dollars and ninety five 
cents uh, per gallon. And so the incidence, the burden of the tax, is most heavily weighted onto consumers. So when we see an incidence where there's inelastic demand and elastic supply, consumers will end up paying the majority of the cost. Why? Because they have limited flexibility. I mean, they have to pay for this product for whatever reason. Maybe it's a necessity, and so it's highly inelastic. Um, so consumers have got to pay for it or have to buy it, so they will pay the cost of the, the higher price far more than uh, producers do who have lots of alternatives and who could uh, switch resources out of this market. And so they're more price elastic, meaning they will pay less of the tax. The opposite is then true. If uh, supply is relatively inelastic and demand is relatively elastic, then we see that in this case, if there's a $5 excise tax on parking spaces, the tax wedge is five dollars um, so the gap between supply and demand has to be the size of the tax in this case five dollars and we see that the original equilibrium price of uh, is six dollars and uh, that's what people were paying consumers were paying now they're paying six dollars and fifty cents suppliers were receiving six dollars in an unaltered market but now they're only receiving a dollar fifty and so we see here then that um, the incidence, the burden of the tax, falls much more heavily on suppliers than it does on consumers. So an elastic demand and inelastic supply leaves suppliers paying the majority of the cost of the tax, um, largely, again, because consumers having an elastic demand means they can get uh, other substitute goods. They don't have to suffer the higher price. Um, they can always move into something else. But with an inelastic supply, producers are kind of stuck uh, with the cost of the tax. So the general rule then for who pays the greater portion of any sort of excise tax is basically who has the highest uh, elasticity. If you have um, the, a, a lower price elasticity, if you're, if you're more inelastic, then you're going to pay the greater share of the uh, tax incidence. So the more elastic you are, Relative to the other side, the less of a tax burden you have. The more inelastic you are, the more of a tax burden you will carry. So why do a tax if it's going to create um, inconsistencies in the market? Uh, largely because it brings in revenue for the government. They have to pay for all sorts of different things uh, that people want in order to function, like parks, roads, fire, police, schools, etc. So this is one way to raise money. Uh, now, how much money do they raise? Well, we can look at the at the uh, graph and we can say that if there is a $40 excise tax, we look for the tax wedge, the place at which there's a $40 gap between demand and supply, and in this case it's at 5,000 hotel rooms. So this is how much um, how much the size of the tax is, is $40, and we can see that it, in this market there will be 5,000 hotel rooms sold, and so we can take the area of this rectangle and say that this area here is what's being taken in the form of taxes as tax revenue. The total tax amount times the number of units being sold gets you the tax revenue. Now, tax revenue does represent a loss in both consumer and producer surplus. Um, the total area of producer and consumer surplus was um, from the vertical axis to the point of equilibrium. But now we have a new, essentially a new point of equilibrium at uh, QT, a new uh, post-tax quantity. And um, as a result, the consumer price at that quantity um, is PC. And so this is the new consumer surplus area and this is the new producer surplus area and everything in blue and red is area that was lost. Now A and C are gained in the form of tax revenue but this area B and F um, is completely lost. There are no economic trades happening uh, because we, we have this new excise tax in the market. So areas B and F um, are what we call dead weight loss. We lose those beneficial and efficient uh, trades. And the amount of dead weight loss is dependent in part on the, the elasticities of both demand and supply. Um, if you look on the left, you see that dead weight loss is relatively larger than it is on the right, and part of that is because uh, supply and demand are relatively more elastic um, than they are uh, in, in the uh, graph on the right. When demand becomes more 
inelastic, the dead weight loss becomes less, in part because people are still purchasing these goods regardless of the fact that the price is rising uh, for whatever reason. And so dead weight loss tends to be minimized. And the same is true uh, with supply. If supply is relatively elastic, we have a much greater uh, dead weight loss than we do when supply is more inelastic. And we'll spend a little bit more time in class looking at some examples and playing around with this. Um, so be sure to fill out the feedback form, and I'll see you in class.